Hello and welcome to Showcase. We have another look at Bauhaus, wolf fashion and a slice of time. We ask, how does the Bauhaus movement affect contemporary art? Why Givenchy turned to a literary giant for his spring summer collection? Why these colors are getting Instagram lovers excited. Germany's Bauhaus movement inspired modern design across the world from architecture to typography. Somehow though, there aren't many physical examples here in Turkey. Well, that hasn't stopped a new exhibition in Istanbul that explores new interpretations of the movement and its transnational impact. Showcase's Sena Arslan checked it out. After paying rent, bills, school debts and all, if you can afford a piece of Bauhaus furniture today, well, good luck. But modern design was not always about using your couch to impress your guests. It was actually about serving people. In 1919, German architect Walter Gropius came up with a radical idea, which he published in the proclamation of the Bauhaus. The question was, how can we create a new world? His answer was this, by the union of all the arts. So he founded a school in Germany that just did that. And when Hitler closed it at the outset of the Second World War, most of the designers moved to the US, and so did the Bauhaus movement. And we're talking about Gropius, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and the painters like Kandinsky and Paul Klee. There, the movement evolved in the post-war period, fostering ideas of democracy and freedom. And soon after, it spread to India, China and the USSR. And for Turkey, well, students here got to hear about it in school. We were able to locate a report by the professor uh, Ercüment Kalmuk and his 20-year uh, uh, work uh, within ITU, uh, where he was trying to form um, workshops that would be becoming, let's say, of a Bauhaus education. I find especially the report of Kalmuk where he speaks of, in 49, speaks, speaks of getting in touch with a professor at Yale and, and then trying to learn more about the uh, Bauhaus literature to improve the lessons that he's giving. The idea of Bauhaus is interpreted in so many different levels and ways. Uh, it's almost kind of like a tag that comes along with uh, certain types of education. This is Salt Beolu on Istiklal Street, and they're offering a new interpretation of the movement as a globally connected institution in a new exhibition, in collaboration with Bauhaus Imaginista, a major international project marking 100 years of the movement. The show comes in four chapters, and what you heard is Turkey's side of the story. For our project, what we wanted to do was to um, explore um, not so much the Bauhaus as a school, but more um, its impact internationally. So looking at the period after 1933, so how did the Bauhaus land in the Soviet Union? What kind of perception in Asia was there for the Bauhaus? And we see that the Bauhaus, in, we traveled to many different continents and we saw that almost everywhere you have an art, art school, design school, architecture school, the Bauhaus is some kind of reference point. But why is this important today? Well, we can actually Google it. This is Google's logo before 2015 and after 2015, featuring serif and sans serif fonts. Serifs are these little additional parts in the letter. The world was all in serif at one point, and for Germans, serifs were part of their national identity. Bold colors, simple and clean designs, functionality. It's modern, more playful and lighter easily produced and commercialized. It led to forming a global identity with great ease. It was the idea of uh, a kind of new start, you know, so after the war, after independence, that there would be that, that the kind of uh, modernity, technology, there was maybe uh, an enthusiasm and a belief that these things could make a difference to society. Um, and I think the Bauhaus was a part of that. It wasn't the whole story, but it was an important part of that story. For instance, in the case of India, the country didn't just fight the British system of governance, but also their strict and traditional sense of style. 
before independence, you had a kind of rejection of the British uh, government school system. So the British imposed a particular education system into India um, that was um, kind of traditional and had, you know, had this division between art and craft, for example. Then in the early 20th century, you had a school that was set up in, by Rabindranath Tagore that was looking to the European avant-garde. So it looked to the Bauhaus, looked away from the kind of British example. And after India's fight for independence, the country's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru said, the design must be used to develop the country. That's why Bauhaus is about more than just frivolous fashion. It's about good design, following rational principles, pursuing new forms and solutions to our basic needs. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Robin Schuldenfrey joins me now. She is a senior lecturer in 20th century modernism at the Courtauld Institute of Art. Good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. So, um, speaking of Bauhaus, obviously, uh, I mean, it, it really informs the look and feel of our contemporary societies from everything, like everything that we see in a shopping mall, for example, or buildings. And obviously, you're the expert. It's not for me to tell this all. But what I want to find out is Bauhaus's influence on arts and contemporary art today. Would you say that it was as influential when it comes to arts? I think a lot of the ideas that were taught at the Bauhaus um, have influenced artists who are working today and in the years um, in between. One important aspect about the Bauhaus, one important aspect of the Bauhaus was their so-called preliminary course. And this was a course that all students had to take, no matter if they already came with some art training, in which they really experimented with new materials, the new medium um, that was available to them. And it's part of this uh, art of experimentation that I think is really important um, in art education. And I think that pedagogical focus um, in particular, that you wouldn't be trained to do something specifically about work with more abstract ideas and many, many different kinds of materials before you went on to specialized training. Of course, at the Bauhaus, you couldn't be taught to paint. Um, you couldn't take a painting class. Rather, you worked in the workshops and you learned about modernism. And then you would go off um, to a different future, whether you wanted to be an artist or a designer or mm -hmm. an architect. It all came down to this preliminary course. And we still have this today in our schools. It's often known as the foundation course. And that's an important legacy of the Bauhaus. OK. so. Um I want to break it down. It's really important how Bauhaus obviously contributed to arts education. But then um, when you talked about paintings, it's kind of interesting for me because Bauhaus was basically seen as a move away from traditional art forms. So I think the influence of Bauhaus on paintings is not necessarily, I mean, it's lesser known, let's say, than um, architectural design. So I want to talk about Kandinsky or Clay, for example. Tell us how uh, artists of the era were influenced by um, Bauhaus, I mean painters. How Bauhaus painters um, influenced other artists? Yeah, for example, Kandinsky. Specifically? Yeah, Kandinsky. I think there yes. was a shift from, sorry, so Kan in Kandinsky, for example, there was a shift from expressionism to more geometric forms that resembled machines, I'd say. But can you please talk us through how we see the Bauhaus influence in Kandinsky and Clay? Ah, this is an interesting question. To what extent the Bauhaus itself influenced the artists that were also living and teaching there? I think the collaborative spirit and the environment was very important to them um, and interacting with students. In terms of their actual art, I think that Clay and Kandinsky each had their own mature style. They were each one of the oldest um, so-called masters at the Bauhaus and came um, uh, very much as established artists in the period, had many important shows in Berlin and in Dessau um, during the period, and certainly would have influenced their students. But at the same time, their students would have been urged to go out into the world and do their own work, their own art. So I think, again, um, the idea, the way in which they taught not to create mini masters, as you might have done during the Renaissance, um, or working in large studios um, such as Titian, um, the Bauhaus was really teaching you to think in a modern way, to experience modern life, and that would be reflected in your work. 
clay, um, for example, absolutely in uh, clay, for example, absolutely was reading um, many important works at the time, um, and so his um, work with, say, the famous cultural critic um, Walter Benjamin um, becomes important um, in his painting. And so I think it's really this modern outlook of interacting with the world at large that um, we can see in Clay's paintings, and but also at the same time his own style developing during these years. Okay, so paintings aside, I mean, coming back to your point on education, uh, I, I think it's interesting that interdisciplinary is the buzzword when it comes to contemporary art practices today. But I think a lot of people put forward that that word, the concept, comes from Bauhaus, really, because Agropius believed that believed in the unity of all arts and how they should be in constant dialogue with each other. Would you say that it's too much to say that the interdisciplinariness of contemporary art today uh, derives from Bauhaus philosophy? I think it would be once removed, but I think the system of education allowed for interdisciplinary collaboration, certainly in the years of the Bauhaus and in the teaching that followed um, in 20th century art um, and up to today, where technology becomes very important for art installation pieces today. At the Bauhaus, certainly the incredible avant-garde theater of Oskar Schlemmer, or the metal that was coming out of the metal workshops, very much influenced other aspects of the school. Um, even the weaving workshop, working with new materials um, such as cellulose into the weaving itself. So how can we use all of the modern world and bring it into our artworks, into our objects that we're designing, bring it into theater um, and um, the other arts. I think that total work of art or that idea that um, you can bring together the arts and that creativity, that spirit of experimentation, that spirit mm -hmm. of creativity is very much alive um, in the years of the Bauhaus and I think it's an important aspect of their legacy. Okay, well, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. But thank you so much for coming on our show today and the great analysis. Thank you. Recently on Showcase, we said maybe Hollywood is running out of new ideas. As if they heard us, Harrison Ford announced that he's starring once again in an Indiana Jones movie. So we decided to investigate why are the movie executives going back to sequels, prequels, reboots and remakes even when they lose money. Harrison Ford was in his late 30s when the Indiana Jones franchise was born in 1983. Today, Ford is 77 years old. And that's despite this tidbit of cinematic glory. However, Hollywood is going back to the same well for the nth time, and that is nothing new. Open up a movie magazine from the 1930s, and you can find reviewers criticizing studios of the day for producing nothing but sequels instead of creating something original. One such never-ending series from the era was The Mummy, which was relieved once again from its bandages in 2017. The film got panned, lost the studio's money, and yet Universal Pictures is still thinking of bringing back its other classic monsters, like The Invisible Man. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh. did you want to? Sorry. sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next time. Okay. These movies, and much more, like the recently rebranded yet failed Ghostbusters, started as hits with audiences, but over the decades got diluted through endless sequels, resulting in scattered success. Yet, Hollywood keeps insisting on recycling the same films and same storylines over and over again. Why not offer something fresh? As USA Today's Chris Heady once put it, it's the movie studio's dream of finding that one flourishing sequel that will put them back at the top of the industry again. And according to Heady's piece, they're counting on one thing the unsatiable appetite of today's viewers for binge-watching. 
Forgive me. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of arts and culture. Disney has reportedly bought the rights to the hit musical Hamilton, paying a record $75 million. It's the highest ever price tag for a stage show. The modern take on America's founding fathers is set to stream on Disney Plus in 2021. Amazon Studios has gone on a Sundance spending spree. It's paid $33 million for the rights to five movies that premiered at the film festival. That's the most in the event's history. In comparison, Hulu spent $17 million, while New Line shelled out $15 million. The son of late soul singer Aretha Franklin is alleging gross mismanagement over her estate assets. Cal Franklin is pushing a California court to give him control as Franklin's niece requested to step aside as executor. Since the singer died in 2018, lawyers have helped themselves to almost half a billion dollars in billings. Family drama over her money erupted recently over the discovery of several handwritten wills. Legendary TV producer and director Gene Reynolds has died. Among a long list of successful TV shows, he created the 1970s hit show, MASH, along with My Three Sons and F Troop. Reynolds passed from heart failure while in hospital in Burbank, California. <music> Author Virginia Woolf has become the muse of British fashion designer Claire Waite Keller. Entitled as Love Letters, Givenchy's Hot Couture Spring-Summer 2020 show takes its roots from the love letters written by Virginia Woolf and her poet lover, Vita Sackville West. It's not only her romantic correspondence that influenced the fashion show. The designer also pays homage to Woolf's novel Orlando, which deals with subjects like identity and gender. Maggie Hom is here with me now. She is Emeritus Professor of Cultural Studies at the University of East London. Maggie, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. So, it's not only Givenchy. We are seeing um, Virginia Woolf influence um, and inspiration on catwalks a lot. What is the charm of Woolf for fashion designers? Well, I think Woolf is, is everywhere in culture, uh, popular and high culture, but the theatre is particularly fascinated by Wolf. Uh, Katie Mitchell is bringing Orlando to the Barbican this year, uh, and she directed The Waves at the National Theatre. Vienna State Opera has got Orlando and costumes designed by Comme des Garçons, um, an avant-garde uh, fashion designer. And Givenchy uh, has referenced Orlando in uh, the Couture Show this year. Most importantly, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is showing uh, an exhibition of Virginia Woolf and also Orlando is referenced in the Met Gala, which is just the high point of the fashion year um, this year. Uh, and of course, the film Vita and Virginia, which was about the love affair of Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf, uh, had extraordinary, uh, wonderful costumes. But Wolf has been on everything for a very long time. In the 1980s, the New York Review of Books uh, decided to give a free T-shirt to subscribers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it chose two images, one of Shakespeare and one of Virginia Woolf. And Wolf was on the cover of Time magazine in the US as early as 1937, because her book, The Years, had been a bestseller. And artists have always been interested in Wolf. My favorite yes, is Patti Smith. Yes, Peggy, sorry to cut you off there, singing. but it's actually an interesting point where yeah. you're at, because uh, obviously Virginia Woolf is a big part of popular culture, but so are so many other writers. So I wonder why the fashion world is so fascinated by Virginia Woolf. For example, I don't know, please enlighten me. Did clothes play a big role in uh, Virginia Woolf's writing, for example? Well, I think the fashion world is particularly interested in Wolf this year and last year because of Wolf's ideas about the fluidity of gender. I mean, that's a huge topic today. 
Um, and of course, in Orlando specifically, uh, the, Orlando starts as a boy in the Renaissance and Elizabethan period and then becomes a woman in the 20th century. So there's heaps of scope for costumes. But the other reason, I think, is Wolf's variety, um, not just as an intellectual in the canon, modernist canon, but of course she's a feminist, she's a pacifist, she's a socialist, and she's a, a sadist. Mm -hmm. So there are so many groups of people who would be interested in her. I wonder how you feel when you see um, those collections on the runway? Well, I'm very happy because it means that more and more people are going to read Virginia Woolf uh, <laughs> and come to know about her. And I'm particularly happy about, there's a wonderful outfit in the Givenchy Couture collection. Uh, sadly, it's about £7,000, so I couldn't afford it, but I would absolutely love to wear it. And it's very much the kind of thing that Virginia Woolf would wear. Okay, well, Maggie, this is lovely, but unfortunately, we're out of time. It was good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for coming. Good news for Instagram lovers. Your stories are in for a treat at London's Now Gallery. French-born and Tokyo-based architect Emmanuel Moreau is dividing the exhibition space with a colourful new technique called Shakiri. Let's check it out. Shakiri is an invented name and it means to divide space using colours in Japanese. Emmanuel Moreau got the inspiration from the colour scape that makes up Tokyo. When Moreau first visited the Japanese capital, she says she got overwhelmed by the onslaught of neon store signs electrical cables, and the fragments of blue sky between various columns of buildings. After moving to Tokyo, she started to use colors as three-dimensional elements, and Slices of Time is one of her 100 colors installation series. It expresses the flow of time, reflecting the past, present, and future. The gigantic art piece forms space using 100 shades of colors and the artist aims to give emotions through this rainbow-like effect. Each layer express represents one year, and um, you have the white one, which represents the past from 2000 to 2019, and the 100 layers of colors represent the future, next, the next 100 years to come, from 2020 to 2119. Earlier works of the architect have traveled around the world from Tokyo to Paris, and they've been tempting for Instagram lovers, and Moro is loving it. I think it's, very, it's a very positive thing for me, because when people take photo, it means that they feel something, they, they, they feel that the installation is beautiful, or they, they feel emotions. The curator says social media is a great way to look at the exhibit, but believes people coming to the exhibit in person will be able to feel it. When you look at it, you think it's going to have arrived by magic from Tokyo, but in fact, it was 13 technicians, two scissor lifts going up and down and up and down endlessly. It's 168,000 numbers and an awful lot of very thin wire. So it's taken two weeks to do, and we're absolutely thrilled with the finished result. The exhibition runs until late April at London's Now Gallery, which gives you between now and then to take a colorful journey through time and space and travel between your past and the future. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. Before we go, Gazans are not just taken to the streets, but to the walls of their neighborhoods to protest foreign interference in their politics. Let's take a look.
Thank you.